It was once crowned the King of Cheeses, and may date back to the reign of Frankish Emperor Charlemagne. Today, it comes in all shapes and sizes, and is easily confused with camembert. Let's learn about the history of Brie. Hey there, cheese historians! I'm Julia, and this is Cheese History, a channel all about the history, origins, and impact of cheese. In this video, we're looking into the history of Brie, one of the two most well-known French white mold cheeses, the other being its cousin Camembert, who I'm also going to do a video on, so keep an eye out for that one. If you don't want to miss out, don't forget to subscribe. Before we get into the history of Brie, to avoid any confusion, let's look at the differences between Camembert and Brie. One of the questions I get asked the most by friends and family about cheese is, what's the difference between camembert and brie? Both cheeses are widely known as small, usually round, sometimes wedge-shaped cheeses with a white fluffy coating. On the surface, they appear to be the same. And there's always a chance that, if you buy them from the supermarket, they are pretty much the same, but with different packaging. I've never really been able to taste the difference. To understand the difference between camembert and brie, we should start looking at what they're like. Because there's quite a bit of variation in types of brie, I'm going to be comparing the official requirements of Brie de Meux with Camembert de Normandie to try and keep things simple. There are other types of brie that I will come to a bit later on in this video. Camembert and brie are both made from cow's milk and are formed into round discs about 1 inch or 3 centimeters thick. Both have a covering of white mold, usually known as Penicillium camemberti or Penicillium candidum. So far, they sound pretty similar, and you could be forgiven for thinking that these are pretty much the same cheese. There is, however, a vital difference. Size. Camembert is formed into a 4 inch or 11 centimeter diameter cheese, while Brie is 14 inches or 35 centimeters in diameter. So Brie is many times the size of Camembert and can end up weighing 7 pounds or 3 kilos against Camembert's 9 ounces or 250 grams. The size difference also explains why Brie is sometimes sold in wedges rather than as little round cheeses. The difference in size also impacts how long each cheese takes to mature. Because it's much smaller, Camembert takes about 3 weeks or 22 days to fully mature, whereas Brie has to wait at least 8 to 10 weeks due to its larger size. The other difference between Camembert and Brie is where in France they're made. Each cheese is closely associated with the part of France where they get their name. Brie is a region to the east of Paris centered on Meur, Melun, and Nangui, all of which have a history of producing Brie. Camembert is to the west of Paris in Normandy. Where each of these cheeses were developed has a lot of impact on their history, and I will come back to Camembert in a later episode. Now, let's look at the origins of Brie. Brie is usually connected with the Benedictine monastery Abbey de Joie, which was founded east of Paris in the 7th century. To the monks of this monastery is bestowed the honour of first making Brie. It's not too surprising to find Brie associated with a monastery, as after the fall of the Roman Empire, monasteries were one of the main places where cheese was made, along with manorial estates. When exactly the monks started making Brie is not clear, but it is often believed to be before the 8th century due to its possible appearance in an event recorded by the Emperor Charlemagne's biographer in the following episode. In the same journey too, he came to a bishop who lived in a place through which he must needs pass. Now on that day, being the sixth day of the week, he was not willing to eat the flesh of beast or bird, and the bishop, being by reason of the nature of the place unable to procure fish upon the sudden ordered some excellent cheese, rich and creamy, to be placed before him. And the most self-restrained Charles, with the readiness which he showed everywhere and on all occasions, spared the blushes of the bishop and required no better fare. But taking up his knife, cut off the skin, which he thought unsavoury, and fell to on the white of the cheese. Thereupon the bishop, who was standing near like a servant, drew closer and said, Why do you do that, Lord Emperor? You are throwing away the best part. Then Charles, who deceived no one, and did not believe that anyone would deceive him, on the persuasion of the bishop, put a piece of the skin in his mouth, and slowly ate it, and swallowed it like butter. 
Then approving of the advice of the bishop, he said, Very true, my good host. And he added, Be sure to send me every year to X two cartloads of just such cheeses. The bishop was alarmed at the impossibility of the task, and fearful of losing both his rank and his office, he rejoined, My lord, I can produce cheeses, but I cannot tell which are of this quality and which of another. Much I fear, lest I fall under your censure. Then Charles, from whose penetration and skill nothing could escape, however new or strange it might be, spoke thus to the bishop, who from childhood had known such cheeses, and yet could not test them. Cut them in two, he said, then fasten together with a skewer those that you find to be of the right quality, and keep them in your cellar for a time, and then send them to me. Clearly Charlemagne's biographer, a monk by the name of Notka, was doing some serious sucking up to the emperor when he wrote this. Charlemagne doesn't mean Charles the Great because he was a great guy, but because he was the conqueror of large parts of Europe, forming the Frankish Empire in the 8th and early 9th centuries AD. As for the cheese he was fed by the bishop, there's no way of knowing what it was. Notka doesn't give any hint as to where this took place, or who the bishop in question was. The cheese is described as rich and creamy, it has a skin which Charlemagne initially thinks is inedible, and the inside is white. That could describe any number of cheeses. Also, Charlemagne's suggestion of cutting the cheese open to check the quality, then sticking the two halves back together with a skewer, doesn't seem to fit with brie, which is a relatively thin cheese compared to its diameter. Assuming that 8th century brie was anything like its modern day counterpart, it would also be quite gooey inside. A skewer is rather impractical when the insides of a cheese are slowly oozing out. While this could be brie, it also may not be. As far as I can tell, there are considerable questions around brie's monastic origins. Whenever it was first made, brie was spreading throughout Europe by the end of the medieval period, which ran from the 5th to 15th centuries. There is a recipe using what appears to be brie in the medieval English cookbook The Form of Curry, which dates from around 1390, called Tarte de Brie. Take a crust an inch deep in a baking pan. Take yolks of raw eggs and rowan cheese and mix it, and with the remaining yolks, mix together powdered ginger, sugar, saffron and salt. Pour into a baking pan, bake it, and serve it forth. Interestingly, it doesn't use brie in the recipe, but rowan cheese, which could be an English substitute for French brie. Brie was popular with nobility and royalty. Even in the 14th century, the kings of France served it proudly at their banquets. Soon afterwards, the anonymous Bourgeois de Paris, in his diary of current events in the city, measured the severity of surrounding warfare by whether brie cheeses reached Paris. Considering that the Brie region is about 50 kilometers or 30 miles from Paris, that's saying something. If cheese can't get through, things must be bad. I guess it's similar to rating the severity of lockdown by whether there's any toilet paper in supermarkets. By 1420, Brie was used in recipes to grace the tables of dukes in Chambéry in southeastern France. It managed to get further afield too, appearing in London around 1648. It's quite an impressive feat to transport a soft, large cheese like Brie from Paris to London, without all the advantages of modern packaging, refrigeration, transportation, and the Channel Tunnel. One of the reasons Brie was so well known, even beyond France, was because of the proximity of the Brie region to Paris. It was possible to transport the cheese to the French capital as long as it was well packaged to protect it from the trials of the journey. The French capital tended to be a real cultural centre for the wealthy nobility of Europe, and Brie was there to ensnare them all. Except, of course, when there was an army preventing it getting through. But hey, the nobility weren't exactly going to hang around either. That's what they had country estates for. Even though it seems to have begun with a monastery, for most of its history, Brie was also made on farms. This is because the manor system in northern France began to break down in the 10th century. Under the manor system, part of the land belonging to a lord was farmed by his serfs, and the rest was the lord's personal farm, which the serfs had to provide several days of labour each week. As this system decreased, larger estates were divided into smaller peasant tenant farms. The lord still controlled the land, but there was no longer a division between the peasant's land and the lord's farm. So from this point onwards, brie would be made on farms as well as in monasteries. The size of an individual brie was due to the amount of milk produced by a particular farm, so their size would vary depending on how many cows were being milked. Consistency in size doesn't appear until later. They may also have been significantly smaller than the 14 inch or 35 centimeter cheese made today. 
The size may also have been impacted by whether rennet was used. At the end of the 17th century, the use of rennet, until then not widespread, was better understood and the technology became specialised, leading to the large format Brie de Meux with coagulation using rennet. Rennet is an enzyme used to coagulate milk and to make many different types of cheeses including pretty much every large cheese. Because the curds produced with rennet can form a more cohesive cheese. Cheeses that are coagulated by letting milk become acidic are crumblier and have much more difficulty staying together. I imagine that brie made without rennet would be of a different texture to its rennet coagulated counterpart. The differences in size and coagulation mean that brie would have differed widely depending on which farm made it. As there was more understanding of what was happening, it would have started getting more consistent, but not as consistent as that made in factories today. A much later development of brie is its colour. Unlike the pure white of modern brie, the rind of any brie made before the 20th century would have been a mix of whites, greys and even oranges. This is partially because the mould responsible for the white rind, Penicillium camemberti, was not originally white. The wild relatives of this mould have a greenish-blue spores. As scientists began to industrialise microbes used in cheese production, the white mutants of this mould spontaneously appeared, and these mutant strains have been used ever since. The other reason is that these moulds wouldn't have been added to the cheese during the making process like we might today, but back in the day before anyone understood about mould spores, they were present in the cellars where the cheese was stored. Each cellar could have its own mix of moulds and lead to a different mosaic of colours growing on the surface of each brie. Brie was apparently the favourite cheese of King Louis XVI of France. The story goes that he was eating brie when he was arrested during the French Revolution. He was later executed. Perhaps being associated with the unpopular monarchy was not the best thing to happen to brie at the start of the French Revolution. You know, that time when the French monarchy and the upper classes were overthrown and exiled or executed. It doesn't seem to have harmed Brie's prestige, though. The French Revolution saw it become the people's cheese, and the revolutionary La Vallée wrote the following during that period. Brie cheese, loved by the rich and poor, was preaching equality before this was thought possible. Nice save, Brie. On top of surviving the French Revolution unscathed, Brie was famously declared to be the king of cheeses by French statesman Charles Maurice de Talleyrand Peugeot. Talleyrand was a tireless promoter of Brie, which he called the king of cheeses, supposedly at a dinner at the Congress of Vienna in 1815 when Europe was slicing up post-Napoleonic Europe. It was said that Brie was the only king to whom he ever remained loyal. Clearly, if you're a king, Talleyrand is not the guy you want to have your back. Anyway, the Congress of Vienna was where the negotiations after the Battle of Waterloo and the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 were held, where representatives from the states of Europe met to redraw the maps and try and establish lasting peace. Journals and memoirs from ambassadors record that in 1815 a debate broke out about which nation had the finest cheese, and Talleyrand proposed hosting a competition to decide the matter. Other sources suggest Talleyrand simply proposed the competition as an amusing diversion. Regardless, the competition was held and 60 cheeses entered. Among them, England was represented by Stilton, Switzerland by Emmentaler, Holland by Adam, and Italy by Stracchino. The Bré de Meux from the Villeroy farm, 10 kilometers west of Meux, was the last cheese presented to the 52 judges. Though the negotiators had consistently rated their own national cheese the highest, they were unanimous in voting Brie de Meux, Le Roi de Fromage. France also ended up getting quite good peace terms out of the Congress of Vienna, as well as the title of King of Cheeses for Brie de Meux, which is quite impressive considering Napoleon had spent most of the previous two decades conquering and going to war with the different parts of Europe. The two couldn't possibly be connected. Anyway, well done, Brie. I talked about the European Union system of protected designation of origin, or PDO, in my video about the history of feta, so check that out if you want more detail. In brief, PDO is a way to preserve traditional and regional products made in EU countries, like cheese, that have a long history of being made a certain way in a particular area. Having this status prevents other countries or areas producing a knockoff version of the product more cheaply on an industrial scale while using the same name, undercutting the smaller traditional producers. 
Two types of Brie gained PDO status in the 1990s, Brie de Meaux and Brie de Melun. Meaux and Melun are both towns in the Brie region of France, and the cheeses they are named for are very similar. Both are made from raw cow's milk, coagulated with rennet, formed into a flat cylinder covered in a layer of white mould, aging for at least four weeks. The key difference between them is their size. A single Brie de Meaux weighs 2.6 kilograms, roughly 5.7 pounds, while a single Brie de Melun weighs around 1.5 kilograms, roughly 3.3 pounds, and has a smaller diameter, otherwise it would be a pancake. Both have strong and complex flavours. While Brie de Meaux and Brie de Melun are the two types that have PDO status, there are many other types of Brie as well, like Brie de Nangji, which is smaller again at around 1 kilo, 2.2 pounds, and has a milder flavour. Typically, commercially produced brie tends to be made into smaller camembert-sized discs, or in small wedges, a pointer back to the traditional size of brie. It also often has things like truffles or chilli added to complement its normal creaminess. That is all I have today about the King of Cheeses. Let me know in the comments whether you think brie deserves the title King of Cheeses, or whether there is another cheese you think is more worthy. You can follow me on Instagram and support the research that goes on behind these episodes over on Patreon. Thank you to all my patrons. And that's it for this time on Cheese History, and I will see you around.